Hi, I'm Ed Sperling. I'm the Editorial Director of Semiconductor Manufacturing and Design. I'm here with Jean-Marie Brunet from Mentrographics. In the past, DFM has been sort of a hard sell. It, something has changed recently because the numbers are showing that DFM sales are way up. What's driving that? So what's really different and is actually good news for us is that uh, most of the uh, advanced customers going to uh, bleeding nodes, uh, they actually are now moving to buying wafers. They are not buying good dyes anymore. Not all of them, but I will say the vast majority of the big ones. So there's a transition going towards buying wafers, which means they have to deal with yield themselves rather well, than buying good dyes. What's behind that shift? I think what's driving that change is the fact that it's more and more difficult to have actually good yields back in the fab. So um, it was easier for foundries to say, okay, I'm going to entertain a relationship where you buy good dyes, therefore I'm taking the responsibility of the yield issues. Um, and um, now with advanced node, it's very difficult or more difficult to actually get established good yield and good procedure in terms of manufacturing processes. And therefore, um, they want to move that issue of yield back in the hands of their customers in a way. And therefore, uh, customers have to um, pay attention to uh, more to what they actually prepare before tape out and get a GDS2 quality that is uh, good enough so that there's no surprises post-manufacturing. Uh, so the relationship is a little bit different. They have to actually staff internally team to look at yield ramp, which means additional tests. So it's also an opportunity for our uh, test business unit uh, to participate more in uh, that solution with the customer. So overall, the food chain is a little bit different. It's obviously good for DFM because now nobody is arguing about doing DFM. They know they have to do it and customers, um, they do it. They, they run it and they are more and more educated and more and more comfortable with uh, running DFM. What's been the effect of double patterning on DFM? Uh, with double patterning is, particularly with 20 and below, uh, it's, it's more and more complicated. Um, as we have seen uh, over the past uh, years or two, um, is basically a situation where um, to get a design uh, double patterning clean is an additional step uh, that is perceived to be done at the end, like Calibre DRC, for example. Uh, but it's not only that. It's affecting uh, most of the layers and most of the step of the design flow. So, for example, for front-end layers, uh, it's actually affecting the um, creation of the stunner cell, the placement of the stunner cell, and therefore um, the placement, uh, place and route solution has to deal with placement constraints that are different than before. And the router. The router has uh, additional uh, rules and um, issues to deal with from a double patterning standpoint, which is creating also uh, additional constraint for the router. For the first time, we're starting to hear a lot about routing rules. Uh, we've heard a little bit about that in the past, but at 20 and 14, things seem to have escalated to new heights. What's changed there? So this is actually a very interesting topic. Uh, what we have been looking at from a caliber perspective is obviously at every node, uh, there is a increase, significant increase in design rules. Uh, you always see charts that we provide that are basically showing an e exponential growth uh, with the number of DRC rules. Uh, so that means that for all layers, we have to deal with additional DRC uh, constraints and count of rules and operations, which we deal with very well with Calibre. Uh, this has another consequence, which uh, is not very uh, discussed, uh, but is actually very problematic is you have more and more rules for the router. Um, routers, they used to close their design with what we call the tech file, technology file. If you look at a 65 nanometer tech file, you probably have 150 at the max type of rules. If you look at a tech file at uh, 20 nanometer, you get probably 2,500. So it's a significant increase, uh, and that means the router has additional constraint to deal with. And we see very often that uh, most of the routers are not completely DRC clean. And uh, the reason is because now, if you look at particularly uh, metal layers or via layers, um, the type of rules are extremely complicated to deal with. Um, an example that we always use is via. Via are very complicated now. We're not doing double via. Uh, we are doing rectangle via. So to do rectangle via, you have many orientation uh, type and different constraints on how to place 
this rectangle via. When did we start seeing rectangular vias? Was it 28 nanometers? Uh, 28 nanometer was the beginning of rectangle via. Uh, before, it was single via being replaced with double via, uh, which was good for um, critical area and defect density. Uh, 28, we moved to rectangle via, which was difficult for the routers to actually uh, um, you know, be compliant with. And now with uh, 20, we see rectangle via and double pattern. So now it's very complicated for a router uh, to actually uh, finish correctly a design. So that, that is really a, a consequence of the explosion of uh, design rules. Uh, now we see that, that for the router, it is difficult. Uh, they have not only to change the algorithm, but they have to change completely how they do things. And uh, not every router is able to do it. Most of them have tremendous difficulty. So there is a problem to really finish from a DRC, physical verification, and DFM standpoint, uh, a layout right now. Is that a function of time to market, or is it complexity and the routers can't handle it at all? What's driving that? Uh, it, they start to have, uh, customers start to have problems with that. Uh, it was always the case um, for many, many generations. Um, the design flow was always, I'm finishing place and route, then I go to Calibre DRC sign off, and I have issues. And uh, with those issues, I'm opening the layout and I'm trying to understand uh, really what the problem is about. I'm looking at the design rule manual and I'm making modification to the layout and save the database, I pray and I tape out. Well, so that was working for many nodes, but now with uh, advanced node, you have thousands and thousands of DRC rules. You have 2,000, 2,500 pretty much uh, rules that are related to the router. You cannot do that by hands anymore. So that, that, that's the fundamental problem. Now, double patterning has certainly made things more complex, but we're starting to hear about triple and potentially quadruple patterning. What's going to be the effect of that? So it's a very, a very interesting question because already with double patterning, it's, it's challenging enough. Um, we, we see that uh, um, with the rules applied to uh, double pattern layers, uh, we still have issues with density balancing between the two masks. Uh, so now we're talking about tr three masks or even quadruple. Uh, so the density balancing among those three or four masks is even more complicated. Uh, so I think we'll see, as we have seen with before no uh, other nodes, is an explosion of rules. We, we see more and more rules and more constraints, uh, which is uh, obviously a challenge. Uh, for uh, design rule uh, checking tools, DRC tools like our tools. Uh, but um, this is something we have been dealing with, with double pattern for a couple of years now. And uh, we are prepared for double, triple, and quadruple pattern. Is lithography having an effect on DFM? We've got EUV, which is late. We've got things like DSA, uh, directed self-assembly. We've got E-beam coming. How does all this fit together? So EUV uh, was supposed to be here. Uh, it's not here yet. Um, there is potentially now uh, an entry point for 10 nanometer. Um, a lot of issues still remain with EUV um, that are in many angles. Um, one of them that we're looking at is defect. Defect is very difficult to, to manage. Um, so I will say that uh, when we reach a point where EUV is a little bit more sure to be introduced, then we'll answer that question. Right now, it's still uh, still a bit uh, behind schedule. One of the big new changes is FinFETs. How do they affect DFM? So FinFET is a very interesting uh, inflection point. Uh, the, the raw performance and characteristics of the transistors are, are very different. Um, now we're gaining in ION and IOF, um, and um, even the layout is completely different. If you look at a layout of FinFET versus a traditional uh, bulk CMOS transistor, it's very different. Um, so um, as a consequence, we'll have more rules. Uh, we have to look at uh, extraction consideration, uh, which we, we are looking at, as well as uh, timing with a SPICE simulation, obviously. So the model has to be able to take care of the FinFET characteristics. Um, we have also seen uh, some uh, implication in uh, field placement. Uh, FinFET is obviously a very regular type of uh, transistor structure, and we need to feel around the transistor and around the cell with very regular symmetry, symmetrical type of structure uh, of uh, field FET structure. 
Uh, so we have seen a direct uh, consequence of FinFET insertion to the field flow. And uh, the field flow is, is because of FinFET, very regular, um, very constrained, and uh, very difficult. Jean-Marie Brunet, thank you very much for your time. Thanks, Ed. Thanks for your time.